Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. I'm here with Dr. Vivek Murthy. Uh, my name is Dr. Sohini Stone, and I am the Chief Medical Officer and Clinical Lead for our health and well-being efforts here at Google. I'm really excited today to have this conversation as we think about workplace health and well-being. A little bit about Dr. Vivek Murthy. He was confirmed by the U.S. Senate Senate in March 2021 to serve as the 21st Surgeon General of the United States. He previously served as the 19th Surgeon General under President Obama. As the nation's doctor, the Surgeon General's mission is to help lay the foundation for a healthier country, relying on the best scientific information available to provide clear, consistent, and equitable guidance and resources for the public. As the Vice Admiral of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, Dr. Murthy also commands a uniformed service of over 6,000 dedicated public health officers, serving the most underserved and vulnerable populations. The first Surgeon General of Indian descent, Dr. Murthy, was raised in Miami and is a graduate of Harvard, the Yale School of Medicine, and the Yale School of Management. He also recently launched a new podcast, House Calls with Dr. Vivek Murthy, designed around how conversations can have the power to be healing. A renowned physician, research scientist, entrepreneur, and author, he lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Dr. Alice Chen, and their two children. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Well, thanks so much, Sohini. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. Yeah. So to kick it off, as I just shared, and you have shared publicly in the past, you have, uh, you're known as the nation's doctor, but you also ha have a role as a husband and a father. So I'm really curious, how do your kiddos introduce you or refer to you? <laughs> well, my, my kids are young. My son is six and my daughter is almost five. Um, so I don't know that they uh, talk about me much with their friends. I don't think I'm a, a s important enough topic of conversation. But when they do uh, refer to me, they just call me their papa, and I'm the one who tells them crazy stories. I tell every night I make up a bedtime story uh, to, to tell them, and it's part of uh, our bedtime routine. They also tell me that I am the loudest and the silliest member of the family. So <laughs> uh, that that's who I am to my kids. I love that. Yeah, um, I always I love hearing about people's children. I'm a pedi pediatrician, so this is, is always interesting to me to hear how kids are thinking and absorbing what's going on in the world. And and my own kids also, they don't they don't talk about me as a physician at all. It's always something else that I've been doing, like making a cake for their birthday or something like that. <laughs> Um, so let's dive in. We really want to hear from you about how you're thinking about workplace health and well-being. And, and in this time of uncertainty that we're all facing, you know, what can and should companies like Google be doing to support our employees? Well, I, I'm glad you asked, Sohini, because this really is a, a time of, of great challenge. And we, you know, we often say that, you know, there, there are always things in the, you know, in the world that are creating challenges for us. But really, when you look at the last three years in particular, with the impact of the pandemic on top of all the other uncertainties that people were dealing with, the changing economy, threat of climate change, with many parents, you know, struggling to manage a rapidly changing environment for their kids, including a technology environment that's rapidly changing. All of these things, uh, whether they're good change or bad change, can be unsettling uh, and they can be hard. But on top of all of that, to go through a pandemic which dramatically increased uncertainty and created real loss in people's lives, uh, loss of loved ones, uh, loss of your own health at times, but also loss of, uh, you know, a sense of possibility for the future. You know, this has really taken a toll. And so <clears throat> while no organization has been spared, uh, you know, because we all, all, every organization has staff that they need to care for and manage, uh, I do think that there are some common sort of approaches that one can take that can help in a moment like this. I think one of the things that's really important is to, is just to simply acknowledge uh, the fact that this is a challenging time for employees and a rush sometimes to get back to normal, we can uh, we can skip that step as basic as it sounds. The second thing that's important is to make sure that we are creating spaces for us to hear from uh, our team members and our staff about not only how they're doing, but what they think the organization could be doing to help and support them better going forward. Giving people a voice and a seat at the table is, is a form of empowerment. It's a way of giving them agency and that can help tremendously when you're feeling disempowered uh, by everything that's happening in your environment. Uh, the third thing I, I would mention also is the importance uh, of supporting greater access to mental health services. You know, all of us 
they from time to time need support with our mental health. There's nothing to be ashamed of in that. That's just part of being human. Uh, but not everybody has ready access, you know, maybe because of where they live or their insurance company doesn't necessarily provide, uh, you know, an adequate network or there may be a myriad challenges, number of challenges, but making sure that we're doing what we can as an organization to increase access to mental health care and counseling is critical. And one last thing I'll mention is, is community. You know, and as human beings, we're actually extraordinarily resilient. Mm -hmm. We can get through all kinds of incredibly difficult scenarios and, uh, you know, even when the odds are stacked against us, but we're much better able to do that when we are together, when we are supported yeah. by other people, when we are alone, uh, whether we either because we actually are physically alone or we feel alone, like nobody has our back. And sometimes even everyday adversity can feel overwhelming. So that's why creating spaces where people can actually come together, get to know one another, share experiences, support one another, uh, is actually incredibly important. And the workplace, you might think, is the workplace really the place to do that? Well, it turns out yes, because many people don't have that in other parts of their life. But having a community at work can sometimes make all the difference in how people feel. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know you had a recent conversation on your podcast about this issue of how to be, how people can be resilient to change and manage through change and also the importance of community and connection and allowing you to have that resilience. And so I see that the work what you're saying today is that the workplace is a really important place to create that resilience in people and actually give them that place to have that sense of connection. What do you have um, any best practices that, that you've seen that companies like Google are doing to help with bringing together the bringing those moments of connection? I'm happy to also share some of the things I know I've seen here. Yeah, well, I'd certainly love to hear um, what you're seeing. Uh, you know, I, I have I'm always looking out for you know, good practices that people uh, in, engage in. And, you know, I'll, well, one example I'll give you is, um, uh, you know, an example that we actually use here here in our office, which is mm -hmm. that we uh, we, you know, we when I started down on the Obama administration, we we were exploring a lot of different ways to help people come together and build community. And one of the interesting pieces of feedback we received uh, was that traditional means or approaches, um, for example, having com you know company picnics or uh, having happy hours after work. And while those were often appreciated, uh, they were hard to do. They involved mm -hmm. a lot of time, time taken away either from work or from family. And often what people talked about the most in those situations was what they had in common, which it turns out was work. And so what we were finding is even after organizing some events like that, that they didn't always help people develop a deeper appreciation for who the other person was, for who these folks were on their team. Because mm -hmm. uh, the truth is that we're more than the skills we possess, right? Many of us have other roles as parents, as community members, as brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. So what we actually started doing was something actually much more simple. Uh, which was every week at our all hands meetings, uh, we would spend a few minutes, usually around 10, 15 minutes, uh, with, where we could give one team member the chance to interview another. And we call that our Humans of OSG uh, exercise, Office of the Surgeon General is what OSG stands for. And it was a simple conversation. It sometimes involved questions about someone's childhood, you know, what they were uh, dreamt about being when they grew up, when they were younger. Uh, sometimes it involved us. Uh, asking questions about, uh, you know, what inspired people, you know, a moment of, of difficulty in their life, uh, a moment um, perhaps when things changed, when they realized that the path they were going on was not the path they wanted to continue on, whatever it might be, whether it was about their family, about their career, about their, uh, you know, their hobbies, uh, uh, you know, their interests and passions. It gave us a sense of who that person was beyond their job. And what's very interesting, Sohini, is that even though this exercise took like 10 or 15 minutes, mm -hmm. so many of us felt so much closer to the person after we heard that interview. And it was very simple, but very powerful. And it changed how people work together. We had a very similar thing that we did uh, in the office when during my prior term as Surgeon General to, to this one uh, exercise that we do now. And it had a very similar effect that sometimes people we had worked with for a year or so, and we thought we knew them well, we would learn uh, these really powerful things about them. And it would change how we saw them. It would change how close we felt to them. And it positively impacted uh, our ability to work with one another. Yeah, I really love how that helps the team go deeper than, hey, what did you do this past weekend? Or talking, as you said, at a social hour or in, in, in a setting like that. I'm definitely going to try that with my team. I hope I hope they hear this and listen and are excited as I am to give it a try. 
Some of the things that, that we've also seen that have been really effective is um, similarly the idea of having space and time for conversation at the beginning of meetings, especially team meetings that are more free flowing, that it's not all part of an agenda of things to be done, but really focusing on how do we get to know each other um, in different ways. Google also has an amazing culture of ERGs and employee resource mm -hmm. groups. And I think those have also been incredibly powerful at helping to give people opportunities to connect, to get to know each other, and importantly, to learn about each other and, um, and the communities that they're in. These ERGs can have folks who are connecting across the world because we are a global company, um, but it's really an important opportunity for community and belonging as well. Well, so I'm so glad that you prioritize uh, those kind of engagements. Yeah. And uh, the, the format I like to think of is very simple, which is a little bit of time and a little bit of structure can lead to big connection. Yeah. And I, I think it, it goes against this notion that we have to invest a massive amount of time for people to get to know one another. The, the truth is, you know, as, as human beings, like we're hardwired to connect with one another. Yeah. It's it's one of the most, uh, one of the deepest instincts that we have. And so with this a little bit of, of time and structure in the right setting, those connections you know, they can happen like magnets, right? And they can um, they can have a tremendous, again, impact on not only someone's work and not only how engaged they feel in the workplace, but it can have a spillover effect in terms of how they do, uh, you know, outside of work, in terms of how they connect with family and how much joy they bring uh, to their other relationships. Um, and lastly, say this, so one of the reasons I think this is so important to be focused on uh, this broader issue of how we support wellness in the workplace, is that right now many workers t are telling us in survey after survey that they're not doing well. So just take the recent uh, Gallup survey, for example, where uh, it turns out that the level of, uh, you know, of, of stress in the workplace seems to be getting worse and not better, even worse than 2020 when it hit an all-time high. So right now, 44% of people uh, in these surveys are saying that they had a very stressful day in the last 24 hours. That's an incredibly high uh, proportion. But also, many people in these surveys, in fact, the majority, uh, are saying that they are not finding meaning in work. Mm -hmm. They're saying that they're not finding fulfillment in their life and that they do not have a sense of optimism and hope when they look at the future. This is what the majority yeah. of workers uh, are telling us on surveys. And one approach to that is to say, well, is that's not the workplace's job. Uh, but the other approach, I think, is to, to embrace the reality, which is that it is our collective responsibility uh, to respond when workers are feeling this way. And when we do so, uh, as I, I stated when we issued our Workplace Wellbeing Search and Analysis Advisory recently, the benefits accrue to workers and to workplaces. Uh, more engaged, more fulfilled uh, employees are not only happier, but they're more productive. They tend to stay longer in organizations reducing turnover costs. They tend to be more creative as well. So again, it's a win-win when we invest in the overall well-being of our employees. And I'm really hearing you speak about well-being as an enabler of productivity rather than something that is at odds with or something that has to compete with time. And 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 I really that mes that message resonates in terms of in terms of even myself, how I feel after a day where I've had a chance to have some deep conversation. I go home at night and I'm a much better mom when I go home than on a day where I feel like I've just been staring at the computer in an isolated booth all day. So absolutely. Well, one of the things that you and your team did last fall was actually you released a framework for how employers can focus on promoting health and well-being in the workplace. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the framework? And you started to get into it, but why are you interested in, in promoting well-being in the workplace? Well, so hey, when I when I was talking to my wife about this decision to come back to to work in government and to serve as Surgeon General again, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about what the most important issue is uh, that I worked on, and certainly this is in the uh, you know throes of the the COVID nineteen pandemic, and COVID was uh, was front and center in that list. But the bigger issue that I wanted to work on was mental health and well being, mm -hmm. because we've been struggling with mental health and well-being for a long time in this country, long before uh, the pandemic. And I wanted to have a chance to do everything I could uh, to help address that crisis. And it turns out that the workplace is an extraordinarily important lever 
when it comes to addressing mental health and well-being. I mean, think about it. People who are employed full-time may spend around half of their waking hours engaged in work. And the truth is also that our workplace, whether we like it or not, has a profound impact on our mental health and well-being. That impact doesn't just stay in the workplace. Uh, it affects how we show up for our families, for our friends, and for our communities. But the flip can be true as well, which is that when the workplace is an engine for mental health and well-being, it can not only positively affect our creativity and productivity and retention, but it can make us better moms and dads, better brothers and sisters, uh, brother, better friends and better community members because we have more in our tank, uh, so to speak, uh, through, which be, through which to be able to give. Uh, to the rest of the world. So uh, the, the bottom line is our workplaces are an extraordinarily important part of our life. And when they contribute to our well-being, uh, the benefits accrue everywhere. When they detract from our well-being, uh, regardless of intentions, then we feel that impact everywhere as well. And you can see this very clearly in, during the pandemic. I think about so many of the roundtables I did with families, uh, you know, over the last uh, couple of years. And I remember, uh, you know, one child, you know, who was in fifth grade telling me uh, that in the pandemic, he knew that his parents were really worried uh, about work, that they were really stressed because of work, and he didn't want to contribute to that stress. So even though he was struggling a lot as a child, oh. you know what was happening, he heard about people, uh, you know, who were getting sick, and he worried about his own grandparents, and he didn't know if his parents were at risk, but, and he was feeling stressed and anxious, but he didn't never told his parents because he didn't want to contribute more to the stress that he knew that they were experiencing at work. Uh -huh. And so I, I think about that as a parent and it breaks my heart. Like I would never yeah. want my child not to be able to tell me when they were struggling uh, because they were worried about what was happening in my, my workplace or that I wasn't happy at work. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is what many families are experiencing every day. Uh, you know, they're, the, the workplace challenges are consuming them in a way that makes them less available than they want and than their family needs. And so th this is what I, I was thinking about, you know, when yeah. I made the decision to focus on the framework uh, on releasing for the first time ever from our office, a Surgeon General's framework for mental health and well-being. And, and it has five key essentials that we lay out uh, that companies can, can use uh, to become engines for mental health and well-being. Uh, and I'll run through those real quickly. Yeah. Uh, we have a moment. But the first is uh, protection from harm. Uh, an extraordinarily high number of employees sustain physical or emotional abuse uh, in the workplace or are harassed or bullied. Uh, making sure that we create safe workspaces for people is absolutely important. Uh, but it's also, it's not just important to protect people from harm, but also to send the message that the workplace cares about their well-being. And part of protecting people from harm is making help available, and that includes mental health services. The second essential is around community and connection. It's fostering uh, a sense of true relationship and understanding between people in the workplace so that when people come to work, they feel like they're working with people who they know and understand as full people, that others see them uh, more completely as well, and that there are people all around them who have their back. The third essential uh, is around uh, work-life harmony. And we know this is one of the, the great um, sort of elusive uh, targets that so many of us chase like, throughout our life. But there are steps that workplaces can do, uh, can take to help. And one of them, it turns out, you know, you know, because this goes beyond providing flexible work arrangements and paid sick leave, which are very important. It also goes to a culture of protecting the work and non-work, uh, you know, division. Uh, and the truth is that a lot of people, you know, go home and they supposedly, they think they're done with the work, but then they're checking email constantly. They're, you know, constantly having to respond uh, to texts. They're checking messages on weekends. They're even checking in during vacation time. Like there's no mental break from work, which impacts them and their families. So work-life harmony and investing in that so that people have the time they need uh, to take care of themselves and the people they love is essential. Uh, the fourth essential is around mattering at work. Uh, it is so powerful when we know that our work matters and that we matter. Yet a lot of people go through their work not really feeling or knowing how the steps they're taking in their day-to-day -day jobs actually connect to the larger mission uh, without knowing how they're helping people. Uh, making that explicit uh, is important. Making sure people feel appreciated uh, and recognized for the contributions they make um, is, is, is extraordinarily important. And the final essential is around growth, opportunities for growth. Uh, you know, we all as, as human beings have a need to grow. 
uh, you know, in, in our lives, and that includes through our work. We may want to grow in different ways. We may have different skills that we want to acquire, areas we want to focus on. But when workplaces inquire about that, when they try to understand how it is that employees want to grow and develop and then give them opportunities to do so, it not only helps create a deeper sense in an employee's mind that the organization cares about them, but it actually is an important investment because it often creates employees who are even more engaged and who can do more uh, you know, for the organization. So these five essentials uh, that I laid out, protection from harm, community and connection, uh, you know, work-life harmony, ensuring people have opportunities for growth uh, and ensuring people know that they and their work matters. These are the foundation for creating a workplace where people's mental health and well-being is supported. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And you started, we talked earlier about some of the aspects of connection and community um, and folks having a sense of purpose as well when they're coming into the workplace, that clarity between what am I doing and, and how to what's how, what's the bigger picture that this fits into? Um, we've had some we've had some really positive strides when we have spent, as you said earlier, a little bit of time up front thinking about what does it take for somebody to truly detach when they are on that vacation time? How do we create redundant systems or cross cover plans so that that person can really take their time off knowing that they'll provide that same coverage for somebody else when it's their turn? Um, so I think there's there there's a lot in that framework. Um, I've read through it and there's so many important nuggets that I hope that others will really take advantage of as well. Um, you know, you mentioned mental health a number of times, I think, in 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 explaining the framework and also just in the background of why you think why you feel it's so important for uh, the focus that you've you've chosen right now. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of the priority of mental health specifically, um, either in the workplace or in general, as you're thinking about the health of the nation? Well, I'm glad you asked, Sohini, because I really do think that mental health is one of the most pressing public health issues that we're facing in the country right now. And I would actually extend that to say in the world, you know, the, for companies like Google that are, are multinational that have a presence, you know, in many countries, it's worth noting that the mental health crisis is not isolated to America. But when I speak to uh, colleagues and, you know, and, and folks in other countries, they tell me similar stories uh, about growing levels of anxiety and, and depression, about suicide rates that are alarming among young people and older people. They talk about the fact that care is still very difficult to access, but that the stigma around mental health persists in many corners of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a challenge that we have to not only be cognizant of, but we have to recognize that the workplace can actually make a big difference here. You don't have to be a healthcare organization uh, to make that kind of difference. But one of my hopes uh, is that we can launch and grow a broader movement to address mental health that will do three things. That will, number one, uh, once and for all eradicate the stigma around mental health that tells us that if you struggle with your mental health that it's somehow your fault and that your mental health is less important uh, than your physical health or deserves less attention that's not the case mental health is health uh, it's just as important as our physical health and and i say that not only as a doctor who has cared for patients and seen the impact that their mental health has on their physical health but as somebody who myself has struggled over the years especially as a child with my mental health but felt the weight of that stigma uh, and that shame and which prevented me from even talking uh, about it throughout my childhood. So that's one of the most important things we have to do is eradicate stigma. And we can do that by starting conversations, by sharing our own experiences, by, by opening up a dialogue with our children uh, and with others in our life who we are worried may be struggling. Sometimes all it takes uh, is opening the door a little bit, letting people know that we are there for them, uh, that we are ready to listen without judgment for them to open up and, and to know certainly uh, that they're not alone. But the other two areas that are worth mentioning that we've got to act if we want to really build a movement around mental health. Uh, the second is to invest in treatment. There are still millions of people in America who need mental health treatment and can't get it. There are kids who are struggling in school who have to wait months and months and months uh, to get care. It takes on average 11 years uh, for from, from between which a child gets symptoms to when they actually uh, get access to care. 11 years. Mm -hmm. That's an unacceptably high number uh, in a country that is as resourced as the United States of America, and I would say in any country. Um, so we've got to make treatment more available, and we've got to use technology to do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we know that in, during the pandemic, one of the silver linings is that it accelerated the use of telemedicine. Yeah. We've got to keep going on that path and expand people's ability to access care from afar. 
And then the third and final area is around prevention. You know, there's nobody I've met in America who says, you know, I'd rather develop a disease and treat it than prevent it in the first place. You know, people would, would rather uh, prevent their struggles with anxiety and depression. Uh, but what we have not done uh, is to invest in prevention programs. We actually have programs in that are school and community-based programs that evidence tells us actually work to significantly reduce the likelihood our kids will struggle with their mental health, as well as with substance use disorders and other challenges later in life. But we are not investing in these programs. Uh, most schools and communities don't even know about them. Uh, we also have to take a close look at technology itself uh, and ask ourselves, where is technology actually helping versus where is it hurting us when it comes to our mental health and well-being? Uh, the more I look at the data and speak with researchers in the field, the more my concerns grow for, with, with uh, social media, for example, that we have not fully understood uh, some of the adverse impacts it can have uh, on our children. And we've got to understand where it helps, but also who is being harmed and when and how so that we can prevent that harm from taking place. Uh, but when I talk to young people around the country, <coughs> they tell me th three things very consistently about their experience of social media. They say, number one, uh, they feel it often leaves them feeling worse about themselves as they enter this culture of hyper comparison. Number two, they feel that it often ends up making them feel worse about their friends as they see people doing things without them and they often feel left out. Number three, they see that they can't get off of it because many of their friends are on it and they worry about feeling left out. So this is a place where from a, the standpoint of prevention, where we've got to understand what kind of safety standards we need, uh, what kind of data and transparency is required to ensure uh, that we know what the impact these platforms are having on our kids and we can protect them so they can enjoy the benefits uh, but be spared from the terrible harms, uh, which I worry are taking a toll on the mental health of far too many kids in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and it, it's it's so important to then think about how even though those children and those those adolescents are not the ones in the workplace, the adults in the workplace have an opportunity to really contribute and make an impact on that, whether it's making sure that parents have access to the resources that they need through their benefits and their and their extended benefits that support themselves and their family members, um, and and as a technology company, you know we we're always thinking so deeply about how do we make sure to support responsible use of technology and have technology be an enabler um, versus something you know otherwise. So it's really it's really important to think about all three of those. And thank you for sharing about your own struggles. Um, as you said, I think it can go a really long way for people to hear that they're not alone. So I appreciate you sharing that today. Thanks. Absolutely. One one last thing I was wondering about, and you started to give us one example about your um, how your office and your team does those spotlights, those interviews to help build connection. What are some other ways that you have implemented the guidance from the framework um, that you shared earlier for your team or, or even for yourself? Yeah, it's an important question, and I would certainly love to ask uh, you know you the same question also. You know, what steps you're taking at the organization to help support the overall mental health and well-being uh, of employees? You know, here, you know, in addition to the uh, earlier examples I shared of how we look to build social connection and opportunities for people to know each other beyond their skill sets, um, we also try to take other steps as well to implement the five essentials. Uh, you know, we work very hard to protect people's time when they're off of work, for example, whether that's evenings weekends or vacation time. Um, you know, we know a lot of times people want to, to contribute and help out, but we try to to limit the number of folks who get involved in addressing weekend crises or things that come up off hours because we recognize that that time off is really important to renew. Um, you know, the other thing that we do is we try to create an environment where people feel, uh, you know, appreciated, where they know uh, that their work matters and that they see where they see the connection between their work and our overall mission. And we do that by helping share uh, the progress we've been making, the impact that we've been making, and the feedback that we get from the public in terms of stories and data. Mm -hmm. So that people can see that that initiative or that uh, project or that campaign that they just helped to launch, um, it wasn't just another box checked, but it's actually yeah. making a real difference in the lives uh, of people around the country who we're here to serve. Uh, and finally, in terms of the culture uh, that we create in the office, uh, we work as hard as we can uh, to create a culture where people treat each other well uh, with kindness, where they give each other the benefit of the doubt. Uh, because we know that's so important, especially in stressful environments where you know there are a lot of deadlines or high demands, things are changing often. 
Uh, right. Those are recipes for friction and for uh, disagreement. Um, but we want to make sure, again, that we are working well together and that we're treating each other well and that, you know, our kindness and decency toward one another is not uh, an unfortunate casualty, uh, you know, of, of a stressful job. Uh, so we, we, this is what we work hard to do. It's not to say that we're perfect. Mm -hmm. We certainly have, uh, you know, areas where we can improve and we want to keep improving. Uh, and some days are certainly better than others. Um, but finally, we try to get feedback uh, from our, our team as well. Uh, and so we know like, what's working, what's not, and we can get ideas from our, our team about how to shape uh, programs and interventions and elements of our culture so that ultimately we can create what we aspire to, which is a workplace where everybody feels included, where they feel like they belong, uh, where they know uh, that they are adding value and where they come to work feeling uh, that they're coming uh, to, to work with people who they like and who like them and who value them for who they are. Yeah. That's great. That's great. A lot of parallels to to some to some of the efforts that we're making as well. I know mm -hmm. you've heard about, and I'm sure others have um, seen reports about how through the pandemic, we've really at Google been leaning into the idea of thinking about flexible work schedules, um, our mm -hmm. hybrid work model, to really help people effectively get the work done, have opportunities for collaboration and community building, but also have the space to do the heads down work and the deep thinking that allows you then to disconnect effectively as well. Um, when it is, if you're if you're somebody who has the weekends off or if you're taking a holiday. Um, I mentioned earlier, making sure that we have clear systems for escalations management and redundancies of who's cross covering each other mm. are really important as well to being able to provide that opportunity to disconnect when when you need to. Um, Google's very well known for uh, you know the our OKRs, our objectives and key results. And um, sometimes sometimes people laugh at it and, and it's, oh, it's time to look at our OKRs again. But really, it's such an important and fundamental part of how you help everyone understand what the priorities are and what the key key goals are for for the period for for the company for the team and then for individuals to really be able to see the through line and understand how their work connects back to the broader mission of the organization that they are that they are part of um, and so i think these are some of the areas that that we have a lot of a lot of um, similarities in how we're thinking about and applying some of the aspects of the framework and finally, I'll say, I think it's really, really important, as you mentioned, access to care and all the different types of care, but making sure that it's culturally competent care and being being sure to not just peanut butter spread, hey, okay, now everyone has access to the service, but really working closely with our partners and vendors to make sure that the care that our, our workforce is receiving um, is is culturally competent. It it fills the gaps and is really personalized in a way that meets the needs of the individual, so that it has the best chance of moving the needle, both in terms of clinical outcome outcomes, the experience that the individual is having, and hopefully also starting to bridge some of those gaps in in equitable health outcomes as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So I know we're almost out of time. Last question for you today. We've talked a lot about community. And we know the community is important to well-being. Um, I think mentors are actually a really big part of people's communities. And it is National Mentor Month. So I'd like to close by asking you, what's one piece of advice that you often give to those who you are mentoring? Hmm. Well, one of the things I, I tell all my mentees that I try to remind myself of each and every day is that it's the people in our life that are going to make ultimately the biggest difference in how happy and fulfilled we feel as we go throughout our life. <laughs> and that may seem like an obvious thing to say, but when you look at how we structure our life, for many people, including myself for much of my life, even though we value people, it's really work that was at the center you know, of our life uh, or maybe continues to be at the center. And while that might be okay uh, you know, for some periods of time, when it really comes down to it, like when we think about, when I think about, like the patients I cared for, for example, at the end of their life, uh, patients I had the privilege of sitting next to in those final hours and days, mm -hmm. what they talked about with me were not, you know, the accomplishments they made, like at work. It wasn't how big their corner office it was. It wasn't how fancy their title was or how much money they had in the bank. And it certainly wasn't how many followers they had on Instagram. What they talked about uh, 
or the relationships in their life, about the people who they loved, about the moments of joy that they experienced with family and with friends, uh, about the mentees uh, that they were fortunate to be able to support, about the mentors who guided them throughout their life. It was about relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, so, it became so clear to me in those moments, sitting with those patients, that in the final moments of our lives, when only the most important threads rise to the top, it's really relationships that come out as the clear driver of our happiness and fulfillment. But I, don't, I believe that we don't have to wait till the end of our lives to come to that realization. I think we can act on that wisdom right now, but we do it by prioritizing people. And what does it mean to prioritize people? It means to put people first in terms of where we give our energy and our time. Uh, and so we all will find different ways to do that, like in our life. But I always tell my mentees that this is one of the most important uh, goals to set and to check back with yourself about on a regular basis. Am I truly putting people first? Am I building a people-centered life? When my friends are in need, am I there for them? Um, when I'm in need, do I have the courage to reach out uh, to other people? Do I check on uh, others in my life, even when they're not in crisis, just to let them know that I'm there for them and that we're there for each other? Um, and how do we look for opportunities to serve uh, one another, recognizing that a lot of times it's not the things we ask for, but the things that we need that other people step up uh, to volunteer to fill that that often give us the greatest joy and, and, and make us feel good. So building a people-centered life can be from everything from how you spend, uh, you know, a few minutes of your day to whether or not you pick up the phone for 30 seconds when somebody you love calls to big decisions that you make about where you live uh, and how close you're going to be to family and friends. But however we do it, building a people-centered life making people our priority, in my mind, is one of the most important determinants of whether we're going to be happy and fulfilled later in life. And it's something I try to remind myself of, and I certainly try to remind my mentees of. Thank you for that very beautiful reminder for all of us today as well. Um, with that, I know we are out of time. It's been a pleasure having this conversation with you today. Um, thank you so much. Well, thanks so much, Sohini. It was wonderful to talk to you as well. And thanks for everything you're doing to support mental health and well-being.